Tonight's passage comes from James chapter 1, verses 22 to 27. That's James chapter 1, verses 22 to 27. Do not merely listen to the word, and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like a man who looks at his face in a mirror and, after looking at himself, goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But a man who looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues to do this, not forgetting what he has heard but doing it, he will be blessed in what he does." If anyone considers himself religious and yet does not keep a tight rein on his tongue, he deceives himself and his religion is worthless. Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. This is God's word. While I get sorted out here, uh, just for your information, for uh, those of you who know Ron Jarvis, I think some of you will know Ron Jarvis. Uh, Ron Jarvis passed away this morning. Rather unexpectedly, it came as a bit of a shock to me. I got a phone call this afternoon, uh, just chatting to his daughter, Judy, and she said he uh, got up in the morning, had breakfast, and uh, after breakfast, they came and he was sitting in his chair and he had passed away. Um, I don't have any details, obviously, of when the funeral will be. Uh, as soon as I get any details, we'll, we'll pass them on to you. But Ron, uh, for those of you who don't know who Ron Jarvis is, Ron Jarvis served in this church faithfully over many, many years and was church secretary at the church for a number uh, of years Um, And from what I hear, he did a great job as church secretary, and uh, we're going to miss him. He was also uh, a great cricketer in his day, fast bowler, and I think he also opened the batting, which is very, very unusual. You normally don't get that combination, uh, but he loved his cricket, and I used to have endless discussions with him about uh, his cricket. So it's very sad, uh, but he is now reunited with Peggy Uh, in the Lord's presence, and for that, we are very grateful to the Lord. Let's pray and ask for God's help. Our Father, we are so grateful for the life that you give us in this world. For all its troubles and hardships and difficulties, we also experience great joys, great successes, and are able to enjoy relationships with each other. So we thank you that in the midst of this sometimes painful world in which we live, you remain the same. You are always with us. You watch over us. You guard us. And you work out your purposes for us. We thank you for the joy of being able to be in a relationship with you. We recognize that we are not just called to know you, but called to live according to the way in which you have transformed us when you made us into a new creation at the moment of our rebirth. And so we pray this evening that as we think about your word, as we think about what you have revealed to us, that through the power of the Holy Spirit, you might cause these truths to be burned upon our hearts and also exalt the Lord Jesus Christ who is in our midst. And as is for his sake, and his sake alone, we pray. Amen. Martin arrived late at Sunday school, and his teacher, who knew that Martin was normally very punctual for Sunday school, asked him if there was anything wrong. Martin replied no, that he had been going to go fishing, but his dad told him, He needed to attend church. 
Miss Walter was very impressed and asked if his dad had explained to him why it was more important to go to church than to go fishing. Martin replied, yes, he did. Dad said he didn't have enough bait for both of us. Now, wow, that's humorous. When you think about what we say as Christians and how we act, it doesn't always line up, does it? Even the most godly and the most holy person you can think of and I can think of, even the past saints that we sometimes talk about in ex exalted terms, all of them have their inconsistencies. No one of us is 100% of the time consistent in our faith. We all, unfortunately, sometimes talk a better talk than a walk. And James wants to deal with this reality in our lives. He doesn't pull any punches. He doesn't try and avoid the subject. And he wants us to feel perhaps a little bit uncomfortable tonight as he reminds us of the need for our lives to line up to our words. And he gives us a reminder of the cure for hypocrisy. Hypocrisy is when we talk a better game than what we play. And since all of us in some level are guilty of hypocrisy, it's worth reflecting a little bit and asking ourselves some difficult questions. Is my life consistent with what I preach? Or are there some glaring holes in my life that I need to take care of before the Lord and I need to bring into submission to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. After all, when you and I come to faith, what is the one thing that we do and that Jonathan himself articulated tonight? We bring ourselves in submission to the Lordship of Jesus. And if there is one thing that sometimes causes non-Christians to be turned off Christians, it's when we are hypocrites in the way in which we live. So what does James tell us this evening. Firstly, the need to apply God's word without deception. The need to apply God's word without deception. Look at verses 22 to 26. Let me read them again. Keep your Bibles open. Verse 22. You see, uh, sorry, I'm on the wrong chapter. <laughs> Therefore, get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent, and humbly accept the word which can save you. Do not merely listen to the word, and so deceive yourselves. James makes it clear that hearing the word of God is not enough. In fact, it's better translated, if I can put that the way that the original puts it when it says, do what it says, it actually says, but keep on becoming doers. There is an ongoing action that is necessary for God's Word to be properly integrated into our lives. We can sit here and hear from God, but unless it's translated into the way in which we live, we haven't learned anything. We've just heard words. And so he reminds us that we must put into practice that which we hear. In fact, in the ancient world, Greek and Roman philosophers made it uh, very obvious that it wasn't just philosophy for philosophy's sake, but it was philosophy that meant to be worked out in their lives. And James picks up on that and says it's not good enough simply to hear the Word of God. It must be put into practice. And if we are going to have a relationship with God that reflects what we truly believe, the non-Christian is going to read you like a book. They are going to be concerned to see whether or not your life measures up to what you claim to be. 
And make no mistake, you are under scrutiny from your unbelieving friends. And I dare I say, even from your Christian friends. And when we fail to live up to what we claim to be, people can then point the accusing finger at us and say, see, Christianity is a farce. It doesn't work. Just look at the Christians. They claim to be one thing, but they live in a way that is completely opposite to what they claim. Now, James says we deceive ourselves when we think that simply because we've heard the preaching of the word, that that is enough. Application must follow. Now, notice what he says about deceiving the word. That's like looking into a mirror. Who does this? All of you, all of you, without exception, know what you look like. And when you looked in the mirror before you came to the evening to comb your hair or to make sure that you look decent tonight, you saw your own reflection in that mirror. None of you walked away from that saying, I need to go have another look just to remember what I look like. You know what you look like. And James uses that as an analogy to say that if you know what you look like, then the reflection of God's word must be carried out consistently. Now, what James is not saying is that you should be perfect because none of us in this world live perfectly. All of us at some level live imperfectly. What James is talking about is a consistency of the way in which we live. You should be more characterized by what you preach than what you don't preach. In other words, if your life is a constant model of hypocrisy, then there's something deeply wrong with your life. It must be consistently lived in a way that is consistent with God's Word. Why? Why is that true of a believer? Well, let me ask you a question. What happens when you are converted? What does God do in you? He kills the old person that was a sinner, the old person that loved sin, the old person that reveled in sin, the old person that thought, nothing of doing things that are contrary to God. And in its place, he creates a new person. And that person is a transformed person. That person is now given a new heart, a new disposition, if I can put it like that. That disposition that God gives you now is in line with who Jesus is. And that means that if we are claiming to be new in Christ, the evidence of that new creation is the way in which we live. It naturally follows. And then God continues that process because we are faced with temptation. We are not the finished product. In spite of the newness of that creation, God continues then in our life to keep on transforming us to keep on making us more and more like Christ. And the way he does that is by taking the word of God and bringing the word of God to bear on us that then exposes us and reminds us of those things in our lives that are not being lived out consistently. And if you are a Christian, you will seek to not just hear when God touches an error in your life that is not submitted to his lordship, and you will say, Lord, what do I need to do in order to bring this under your lordship? And you will seek to make, by God's grace, those necessary adjustments. It's kind of logical, isn't it, being a Christian? And so he contrasts the person who is deceived, the person who doesn't put the word of God into practice, and says that person who sits in a pew week after week after week and goes to a Bible study week after week after week and agrees with all that is said but never makes any changes or you don't see any changes, that person is self-deceived. They may as well go and do something else. Now notice what he says. It's really interesting. In verse 23. 
Anyone who listens to the word, but, uh, sorry, I've gone through it, looking at himself merely forgets. But verse 25, but the man who looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom. I want to pause there for a moment. What does he mean? The perfect law that gives freedom. How does law give freedom? And what law is James talking about? Well, James is not talking about the Old Testament law. The problem with the Old Testament law is it became this massive burden that people began to bear because they turned it into a legalistic sense of right and wrong. And people were simply trying to live up to the legalistic demands without the necessary transformation within. You see, it's the same for you and I. If we simply try and live according to a bunch of rules, then we will become burdened by those rules. And it will rob us of the joy of our Christianity. Now, we live according to God's entire law. That's talking about the entire scripture. And in fact, it is the law of Christ that we walk according to. And that law brings freedom precisely because it enables us to know how God expects us to live. God has not left us in a vacuum. It's not as if God just says, okay, you're a Christian now. Now just figure it out for yourself. But rather, God gives us his revelation in his word. And in that revelation, God gives us instructions on how we are to live. And it is as we obey those instructions, as we integrate them into our lives, that we discover freedom. In what sense? Well, I want you to imagine a scenario. Imagine in Australia if we had no laws, that everyone could do whatever they wanted. So if you wanted to go and rob my house, not that there's anything to rob, and you could rob that house, and you knew you could get away with it, and there was no penalty for your robbing me, society would degenerate into chaos. Not so. And if you knew that there was no penalty for anything you did, then how would you know how to live? What would be right and wrong? What would be acceptable and not acceptable? It would end up being in the eyes of the person making that decision. And instead of having freedom, you would live under tyranny because you wouldn't know what you could or couldn't do. And so what Jesus is saying, when God gives us a word, a principle in which we are to live, that enables us to know what God expects of us, to know what God requires, and therefore to live in the freedom of those principles. And that enables us to experience life the way that God has intended us to experience. I touched on this this morning. Why? Because God has created you to live in a particular way. And when you rebel against the way that God has created you to live, misery is brought upon you. That's why we have such pain and suffering in our world. That's why we have so much unhappiness. Because by and large, the world has turned away from God, and the world has said, we will set our own rules. We will determine what is right and wrong, and we will live according to our own moral basis. And God says, the moment you depart from my law, the moment you depart from what I have laid out on how you are to live, then you are going to experience the necessary consequences of that. But if you live according to what I have laid out before you, then you will discover the true contentment and fulfillment of life that God has come to bring us. It's kind of obvious, for your maker knows what best benefits you in how to live in this world. And so we live in freedom under God, for God has shown us has taught us, has revealed to us how we are meant to live, how we are to enjoy abundant life, how we are to gain fullness in life while we are in this broken, 
suffering world. The only per- people who are truly free in this world are those who follow the Lord Jesus Christ. Remember what Jesus said? If the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. He sets you free from the burden of sin. He sets you free from the power of sin. He sets you free from the burden of struggling. And he sets you free to live according to the way that God created you to live. Have you experienced that freedom? Are you living in that freedom? Are you living according to God's word? Is your life modeled on it? Or are you still fighting over some things that you're not sure whether God's got it right? Maybe it's your sexual ethics where you're thinking, Lord, what's so wrong with living together before marriage? Maybe it's the way in which you use your money. Lord, why do I have to give any money to the church? It's mine. Maybe it's your service to God. I don't know. Lord, if I serve in the church, it's going to take away time. If I come and clean the church, Janice and I were here yesterday evening cleaning the church. Lord, I could be using that time better. But God has created us to serve. God has created us to give of ourselves to him and to his service and to each other. And there is freedom in that. There is fulfillment in that. There is joy in that. It is better to give than to receive. The Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and give his life a ransom for many. Jesus lays out what service looks like to the point of dying on the cross. And because he was willing to give himself, you and I enjoy eternal life. Furthermore, applying God's word brings blessing in four ways. Verse 26. If anyone considers himself religious and yet does not keep... Oh, sorry, I'm going ahead of myself. But the perfect law that gives freedom and continues to do this, not forgetting what he has heard but doing it, he will be blessed in what he does. Very quickly, four ways that you bless. Number one, you bless just at looking at the word. Just reading the word brings blessing. And now know that you who are Christians have experienced that blessing. There are times when you read the word. I had a reading just the other night that came from Isaiah 40. And as I read through Isaiah 40, I reread Isaiah 40. And I've left my bookmark on Isaiah 40. And I will come back to Isaiah 40 tonight. Because as I read Isaiah 40, I want you to spend some time there because it was so encouraging. Second, You're blessed in that you continue to do so, that you meditate upon it. There's more to reading than just reading. Sometimes you've got to pause, and sometimes you've got to stay there. And you might stay there a couple of days. You may stay there a couple of weeks. You may stay there a month or more. But as you meditate on God's Word and allow it to penetrate into the depths of your soul, there's blessing in that. Third, You are blessed by not forgetting it, by memorizing it. David says, I've hid the word of God in my heart that I might not sin against you. So that when you are faced with temptation, you have the word of God coming back to your mind as Jesus did when faced with temptation. When the devil said, I will look at these kingdoms, I'll give all of them to you, or or just throw yourself down and the angels of God will protect you. What does the son of God do? He quotes, do not put the Lord your God to the test. Or when he says, I I will give you food to eat, he can turn these stones into bread, he says, man shall not live by bread alone. He quotes, he quotes, he quotes. So memorize the word of God. Bury it deep within so that it rises to the surface at a moment's notice. You heard Jennifer Lee this morning quote Psalm 23 off by heart in two languages. 
So let me ask you, not to embarrass you, Jennifer, do you think you could quote Psalm 23 off by heart? Learn the word of God. Bury it deep within your soul. Finally, fourth, by putting it into practice, I've spoken about that, so I'm not going to go there again. And finally, he says, people deceive themselves if they think they are religious but cannot control their speech. Verse 26, if anyone considers himself religious and yet does not keep a tight rein on his tongue, he deceives himself. His religion is worthless. Now, I'm not going to spend a lot of time in here because we will come back to that later in James. He will talk more about speech in chapter 3 where he will go into a, a whole chapter almost speaking about the danger of the tongue and the danger of speech. All I want to say here this evening is that there is an important principle that comes out here that our speech, what we say, what comes out of our mouth is very important. What does Jesus say about our speech? Out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. If you want to see a person's heart, listen to how they speak. And you'll get a picture of what's going on in here. Watch your tongue. Be careful before you speak. Allow your words to be filled with grace. Do not let, Ephesians 5, do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth, but only that which is upbuilding. Only that will pr promote and help and encourage people. How often do our words tear people down? Secondly, the need to apply the word without selfishness. Look at verse 27. We're going to go a little bit quicker now. Religion that, cast, uh, that our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress. So let's pause at verse A and we'll come back to verse B. The need to apply the word without selfishness. Now, the example that he uses there is not meant to be the example. It is a example. It is a way in which James is trying to say, don't be selfish as a believer. You have been called to serve each other. And the most vulnerable in the society in which James was writing was to the widows and to orphans. Many of them, because of the way in which the society functioned back then, if the husband left the wife or died, they were destitute and without income and without any hope. And so James says, make sure that even in the most vulnerable in your society, that you are giving yourselves to serving them. Now, in our society, it may not be the widows, it may not be the orphans, but it may be. But the point that James is making is ensure that we cast an eye out for others, that we don't just think of me and what I need, but that we consider the needs of others. It's so easy to lapse into self-centered thinking, isn't it? How often do you fight for the remote in your TV? Or when you think about what you want to do, what I want to do. And yet here James is saying, let's consider others. Let's consider those who need our love, our care, our service. The vulnerable in society. So let me try and make this really practical. What about those in our church who are bound up in retirement villages, who have no family? Will we go out of our way to visit them, sit down and spend 10, 15 minutes with them, pray with them? What about those who perhaps are frail enough and old enough that they find it difficult to go do grocery shopping. Will we reach out to them and say, can I help you? 
What about those who are too frail to drive to their doctor's appointments? We have some in the church. Will we phone them up and say, by the way, can we help you? Happy to drive you to your doctor's appointment, bring you home, take you out for a coffee. What about the single people who are lonely? We who have husbands or wives, do we invite them around to our homes, minister to them, make them know that they are loved and cared for as a church? It's so easy to look out for self. And James says, no, true faith, true, and what, that's what he means by religion, true faith is looking out for the needs of of others. We have been called to do that. And then thirdly, the need to apply the word without compromise. The need to apply the word without compromise. Look at verse 27b. And to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. James is very aware of the danger that the world possesses to believers. That's one of the reasons why the author writing to Hebrews says, do not neglect the meeting together because we need each other. We need to encourage one another. We need to support one another. We need to bear one another's burdens. We need to help one another when we are feeling vulnerable. And we need to rescue those perhaps who are being led away by the world. And it's so easy for us to get caught into worldly thinking. It's so easy for us to embrace secular ways, to think that, that somehow the world has more wisdom than what God has. And James says to us, make sure that as you mix in the world, because we are part of the world, it's not as if God is saying, I want you to become a, a nun or I want you to become a priest. I want you to, to live a last life of asceticism where you just withdraw from society and completely get away from it so that there's no way you can be polluted by that. I don't know what you do with your thoughts because your thoughts are still a problem even in that situation. But what he's saying to us is, you are in the world. There's nothing you can do about that. But don't allow the world's thinking to creep into your thinking. Don't allow the world to convince you that they're right and you're wrong. Don't allow the world to cause you to compromise your faith. It's so easy. And he recognizes that we constantly struggle against sin. And it's so easy to, because of our desire to want to be accepted by our friends, particularly if we are dealing with non-Christian friends, that we might succumb to doing things that we know are not right, simply to be accepted by them. James says, don't be polluted by the world. 1 John 2, 15 to 17 puts it even more clearly. Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Hear the words of John. The love of the Father is not in him. For everything in the world, the cravings of sinful man, the lust of his eyes, the boasting of what he has and does, comes not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires will pass away, but the man who does the will of God lives forever. Forever. And so James is reminding us that if you want to truly show what faith looks like, then you will resist the inroads of the world. Sometimes the world screams at us to adopt its practices. I was just talking to someone who will remain unnamed about a, a work conference that they were having, that on one of the days of the conference, it was required of everyone to wear gay pride clothes. What do you do as a Christian? What do you do as a Christian? Do you stand and say, no, this is against my conscience. I cannot do that. Or do you bow to the pressure? Those are hard questions, aren't they? Because what if your job's on the line? What then? It's not easy.
Do we participate in unwholesome jokes? Someone tells a joke and, and we think it's funny even though it's sub-Christian. Do we read the same things that the world reads? Do we dress in the same way that the world dresses? Do we look like the world? Do we smell like the world? Do we act like the world? Do we watch the same movies and TV programs that the world watches? Do we listen to the same music as the world? So easy for worldliness to subtly work its way into our lives. That it becomes very difficult sometimes to distinguish the Christian from the non-Christian. You should and must stick out. You should be a little bit strange to your non-Christian friends. They should look at you and say, what on earth do you want to go for church on a Sunday night? Are you nuts? Why do you go to a youth group on a Friday night? Why not a disco, a nightclub? You don't get drunk, why not? You don't sleep with your boyfriend or girlfriend, why not? You don't date a non-Christian, why not? You don't gossip about people. And when people start gossiping, you excuse yourself from the conversation. How come you do that? You don't pull people apart. You don't tear them down. You don't character assassinate them. How come you don't do that? Uh, James is saying that the Christian is other. They're different. You don't wear the same provocative clothing as the world. You don't visit the same internet sites as the world. You don't indulge in their sinful practices because you're a Christian. That's not what you are. You transformed, you're in Christ. You're a new creation. Don't go play in the mud. You don't belong there. The pig is dead. He's out the mud. You knew. You have the beautiful robes of the righteousness of Christ clothed over you. You work according to a different ethic. Because you're a Christian. Do you see? The need to apply the word without compromise. Is that you? Are you living out your faith in such a way that when you engage with the unbeliever and you leave their presence, they turn to their friend and say, well... They're a bit weird, or they're different. That's what it means to put God's word into practice. That's what it means to be a Christian, a follower of Jesus. And let me tell you, you have ample, ample grace from God to live that way. Draw on his strength. Amen. Our Father, we thank you for your word. I pray that you would help us to be doers of the word, not mere talkers. Help us to put into practice that which we claim to be. Help us to live in a way that truly reflects who we are in Christ. And I pray that we might allow you to continue your process of transforming us more and more and more into the beautiful image of the Lord Jesus Christ. For Jesus' sake, amen.